All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're in our Genesis study. Um, and we are now in Genesis chapter 22. And um, I'm excited about this chapter because it's very prophetic. Um, and we're going to see how the qualities and the things that are said about Isaac here relate specifically and directly to our Mashiach. Um, and this chapter is, is where Abraham's faith is confirmed by Yahuwah. And we come quite a ways. Um, and we've watched Abraham. <laughs> we've watched him make mistakes. We've watched how we can relate to him um, through our lives and how we've taken the time to parallel those same things to us. What would we have done in a situation where we were a hundred years old and we couldn't bear children and our wife was past the age bearing? What would we do? How would we react? What would we do if we, our lives were threatened going into a specific area of, of the country in the wilderness? Uh, how would we respond to possibly being taken over or captured or our wives being taken and ravished, how will we respond? How will we respond as we're going to find out in this chapter we're about to go through if Yahuwah told us to slaughter and sacrifice our only son? And we're also going to see how it relates to the imitator, you know, how it relates to Hasatan and how, you know, he tries to imitate that very same thing in, in, in the wicked part or the wicked side of sacrifice. So um, a lot of things to see here. Um, so we're gonna go through slowly. Um, and we can do, um, let's do, let's do four verses at a time. Let's do four verses at a time. And if, if we need to do more, we'll, we'll do that. Um, who wants to take the first four verses? Go ahead, Brother Rick. All righty. And it came to be after these events that Abraham tried, or Elohim tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, now your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mounds, which I command you. And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offerings and arose and went to the place which Elohim had commanded him. Is that where we're ended at? Verse 4. Oh, I got one more then. And on the third yom or day, Abram lifted his eyes and saw the place from a distance. couple things I was looking at this also on the uh, Sapphire but <clears throat> the thing that stuck out to me the most is there in uh, verse I think it's three by my eyes I got to get some new glasses or something uh, or two is it yeah your only son is where in verse two where he says take now your son your only son. Is that really what he said there? Because he has another son, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Break that down. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's look at that. that. That to me is very interesting that he's saying that this is his only son. You know, because we know he has, you know, another son before Isaac, you know, Ishmael. So why is why is Yahuwah not counting him as his son also? 
You know, why is he telling his only son? Unless this is a another translation thing that we need to look at. But that's really interesting to me that he's saying that. Um, of course, all the way through this, there's the left tavs, uh, which I like to point out again, as uh, I like to do. First one is in the first uh, first verse where he talks a left a left tav Abraham. So we know that he has this covenant with Abraham. And then in verse two, he says, "Take your left tav your son, your left tav your only son Isaac." So uh, evidently, because of the left tavs here, I'm seeing that maybe it's he's referring to his only covenant son. Maybe is what he's talking about in that particular statement. And then in the third verse, he goes in to say and saddle a left tav his ass or his donkey and. And a left eye of the uh, two of his young men. So there's a lot of covenant signs uh, that are scattered all the way through this, even into the fourth one where he says, Abraham lifted up a left eye of his eyes and saw a left eye of the place afar off. So there is, this is like covenant zone over here, you know, all the way through this particular first four verses, we see a lot of, a lot of things that are, basically making statements I think that you can't really see unless you're looking at these left tiles, you know, uh, because it points out, like I said here, his only son, we know he's not going to only, only son. So it has to be his only covenant son is what I'm seeing there anyways. But those are a few things that I see that he, that he's uh, pointed out, you know, uh, to me that I see as we're reading this. Yeah, you, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to let you go in a second, Brian. But one of the things I wanted to point out was while I was studying this and looking at it and even reading through it this morning, I said the Isle of Tives that Rick brings out are really going to expound this passage. And this particular verse 2 is probably the most important because we know two things. We know, one, <clears throat> that the promised seed was through its side, right? Two, <laughs> we know the promised seed was the promised one. And we know that there was also a uniqueness to the way Isaac was born. Three, or this is four, I should say, we know that he used only the same way that the only begotten is used. So this is out of time prophetical of the coming Messiah, but also that the seed was coming through him. So the seed wasn't coming through Ishmael. The seed wasn't coming through his other seven sons that he had with Keturah. It was the, just like definite article, the seed, the son. That's what your only son is saying there. Um, but there's more there. Let me, I'm gonna let Brian go. I don't want to hog everything up. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I was just thinking this, you took the words right out of my mouth, Rod. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. Um, Al Abraham had many, he's a father of many nations. And, but the, the, the promise was through one, one, one son. Like you said, the one, the child of promise was Isaac, and and Yahuwah, He always says he's the he's the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's like specific. He's like it's not. I'm not the Abraham of uh, uh, the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and whoever. He's specific in that the lineage, the the son, the seed that he's. The, the the children of the, the son of promise and it's the same with uh i was looking at um yeah john three sixteen where it says uh for uh for y'all so loved the world he gave his only begotten son and it's like well hold up it's like if you look in scripture it's like you look at the sons of god it can it can refer to men and also of the uh luminaries or the the angels and it's like, well, he, Yahuwah has many sons. And what do you mean only begotten son? But there's only one 
there's only one word. It's like the scripture says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's, 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 in the beginning was a word, and the word was with Yah, and the word is is Yah. There's only one word, and that's that's and his son is the word made flesh. And and that's that that's the only begotten word of, of the most high. I mean right. that's the only that's the only there's only one law, one Torah, and and that's what it's so it's like here you you're seeing that parallel between um yeah, the, the father has many sons, but there's only one word, there's only one Torah. Yeah, I Abraham had many sons, but there's only one one child of the of the covenant of the covenant uh promise and things and uh so yeah i was yeah basically it said the same thing you said rogers in a little different different way but yeah it should, yeah that's definitely what i was listening to let's 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 also that's good brian let's also let scripture tell us too hebrews eleven seventeen. 17 by faith abraham when he was tried offered up isaac and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Right? So we've come full circle with just totally understanding the, to the relation between Isaac and Messiah, the only begotten. So just wanted to bring that out to kind of further illuminate thine only son thine only yeah. begotten. the unique way in which he was born the unique way in which the seed would come through so it could not be mistaken by anyone else you can't say okay abraham yeah but he had another son ishmael so she came through him and that's how muhammad came nah it says the only begotten son the only one the promise was promised through so um that makes it clear you know something stuck out to me what brian was saying there when he talked about he made a covenant but he also, didn't he also make the covenant with uh ishmael that he would make him a uh uh basically of many nations as well come from him and then the other thing that i that i was going to say is that he uh with with Ishmael, you know he. I just lost my whole train of thought. Wow, that just escaped me real fast. I'll come back to it because I lost where it was at. But it was an interesting thought. Oh, it had to do with the the experience that Ishmael had with Yahuwah in when when he was sent away. You would think that he would have taken that too, and that, that he that he also would have been, you know. The, the Elohim of Ishmael and whoever else, but you don't ever hear that mentioned, even though he provided and he guided, he, he you know, uh, he took care of him. He made him also uh, many, many nations come from him or, you know, he, a lot of things came from that, that son as well. But, and it was, I know there was a covenant made with him in the same way, but in a different way, he wasn't the promised one. So, it's interesting when you look at that. That that was what stuck out from what he was just saying there. Why you don't hear that being mentioned and how a whole nother religion came out of Ishmael's lineage when when he had first hand experience with Yahuwah, you know? Yeah, I think I think that's that's primarily where we get the whole understanding of uh Ishmael having a promise, having a covenant. Um, but I think a lot of what a lot of people forget is, you know, the original prophetical word on Ishmael was that he would be a wild donkey of a man. You know what I mean? That he would be known in the wilderness um, and that he would prefer isolation rather than being a part of a community. So there is absolute truth to the promise of that he would be a father of many nations as well. Or many nations would come from him but it says nothing of the promised seed. And we don't have, you know, the only, the only um, time that I remember in scripture is when Ishmael and Isaac reunite to bury their father um, to where there might be a possibility that he could be or could be following or even be remembered to follow um, the Yahuwah of his father. But 
um, you know, we know Islam is definitely not following Yahoo. So, um, you know, we'll look at that more uh, as we go forward, because we're going to come back to that. We're going to come right back to that. Um, but here, you know, Abraham's faith is about to be tested in, in all of the things that that are going through his mind and heart at this time, you know? Um, you know, I was looking at a few things, you know, where it says, now it came to pass after these things, after these things, you know, meaning that something new is about to start, a new story is about to begin. And also all of the things that happened prior to this built up to this moment. And we see that for sure as, Everything that happened in his life culminates to his faith being tested right now. And, you know, the word is used tempted, but, you know, to, it's, all, it's, it's translated better tested because Yahuwah is testing his faith here. He's, he's, he's seeing if he truly follows him. He's not being tempted as, as, as Hasatan would tempt to do evil, but testing to see if he is with him. And, and you know, as we know, we're gonna find out he passes with flying colors. So let's um anyone else have anything in those first four verses? There's still a few more things there. Mount Moriah is mentioned. Um and this is interesting because Moriah uh is where Elohim appears, is where Yahuwah appears, right? He shows up, he says that. You know, we're going to find out later on that he will provide sacrifice. But this Mount Moriah is the same mountain where the temple was made, was built. It's also the same mountain at the peak where Golgotha. So this same mountain where Abraham was about to slaughter and sacrifice his son is the same mountain that Yahuwah sacrificed and offered his son same mountain so we're going to see the parallels and we're going to see how prophetic this passage is even to the point of abraham's or isaac's question being answered anyone else questions or comments yeah would you mind if i read uh because the tourism has something very interesting um that it seems like uh preludes to this event um, would you mind if I read read from it? Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. So <clears throat> it starts off as it says, um, and it was after these things that Isaac and Ishmael contended. And Ishmael said, it is right that I should inherit what is the father's because I am his firstborn. And Isaac said, it is right that I should inherit what is the father's because I am the son of Sarah, his wife. And thou art the son of Hagor, the handmaid of my mother. Ishmael answered and said, I am more righteous than thou, because I was circumcised at 13 years. And if it had been my will to hinder, they should not have delivered me to be circumcised. But thou was circumcised a child eight days. If thou hadst had knowledge, perhaps they, they could not have delivered thee to be circumcised. And Isaac responded and said, Behold, now, today, I am thirty and six years old. And if the Holy One, blessed be he, were to require all my members, I would not delay. These words were heard before Elohim of the world, and the word of Elohim at once tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, me. And it was after these things that Elohim tried Abraham with the, with the tenth trial and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, me. And he said, Take now thy son and thy only one, whom thou lovest, Isaac, and go into the land of worship and offer him there a whole burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee. And Abraham arose in the morning and saddled the asses and took the young men with him, Eliezer and Ishmael, and Isaac his son. And he cut wood 
and figs and palms which are provided for the whole burnt offering and arose and went to the land of which Elohim had told him. So it seems like not only was he trying Abraham, but he was also trying Ishmael. Or not Ishmael, Yisik, because he said, Yisik said, I would offer all my members, him having this conversation with Ishmael. He said, I would, if, if the Holy One, um, blessed be he, required all of my members, I would not hesitate to give it to him, <laughs> to offer myself up. Let me let me jump in here for a second. So, um, I mean that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot added in. Um, that's not here, you know. And uh, you know, I I would be I would want to test that portion um, because it kind of. It kind of doesn't make sense that they would have a discussion after he was already out. He was already gone. So wh why would he come back to talk to Isaac? I'm not. I'm not getting that. Um, there was still well. This actually, because I was I was actually just looking back and forth between this and um, the Book of Joshua just to see how they correlate as well. And in Joshua, there was a relationship between Abraham and, and um, Ishmael. After, even though he had sent him away, that there was still a relationship between them. Um, and so, basically, he was not, I mean, he was casted out, but I don't believe he was, like, disowned. You know, because even though, even Yahuwah says that he will still make him a great nation, so not even you who would disown them. So to me, you know, there there was you know, it's possible there was still a relationship between them. Um you know, and that and that's one of the reasons why I actually took this over and I went to Joshua to see what Joshua had to say and if it lined up at all. But it seems like there was still a relationship between them. Um but yeah, it, it is it is a lot that is that is not there included in you know what we see here in um, the KJV um, or the New King James Version. There is definitely some, you know, there's definitely a, a big difference into how this kicks off. But yeah, that's that's just that's what it said in the Tarzan. So I just wanted to bring that out because, you know, one my question: Why would the you know why would why would the father ask? Um, Abraham to offer his only son, but we kind of see here an explanation for why it would it happen. So, um, yeah, that's just I just wanted to bring that out because I thought I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, it, it is interesting. It's a lot, you know. I, you know, I definitely want to get a copy of that because I want to be able to weigh and 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 try those things for myself. Um, but I think there's enough in Scripture to 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 show why, which we just went over, why um, Yahuwah said your only son, because it relates to the seed, it relates to Yahusha, it relates to the unique way that he was brought forth, right? So. Um, I'm not sure that, that the whole explanation with Ishmael or the conversation with Ishmael was necessary to show that. Um, so, uh, not disputing it, just, you know, I'm very sensitive to, you know, making sure that, you know, what we're reading, you know, is, is absolute truth. So. Um, but I'm not going to dispute it at this point. Just, I just find that, that, that it's like for, in other words, when we were reading the passages last week, the things that you shared from the Tarjan made sense. When you share just now, those things seemed unnecessary. Like it didn't seem like it flowed with what was going on. You understand what I'm saying? It it just it didn't feel like it fit. 
but I could be wrong. Um, but just want to make sure we keep that in mind when we when we look at these things and we look at these extra books and we look at different translations and versions to make sure they flow and they are consistent with the rest of scripture. So, uh, and you may have very well already did that, but I, I definitely want to look at that myself as well. What do you guys think about that particular part, Rick? I'm interested to know what you think. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you, brother. Um, it seemed like there was a whole lot of added stuff there that really didn't kind of fit the storyline so much. So I, I was kind of surprised to hear all of that was added. Um, why isn't that in all of these other translations would be my question. You know, was it removed or was this added or, you know, how did it get into this particular translation that we don't see it anywhere else? You know, but again, I agree with you. If it doesn't flow with the storyline, then it makes me question as well the validity of why is it there? How did it get there? Right. You know? even, like, even like what you said, what you brought out last week about um, when Ishmael was mocking, you know, when you said he was doing strange worship, it made sense. It fit why Sarah would have been like, no way we can't have this and why Abraham would have been grieved. All of those things fit within the flow of what we already had in scripture. And it didn't seem weird and it didn't seem, you know, out of place. Adding in a conversation between Ishmael and Isaac when Abraham's about to take his son to, 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 to sacrifice him doesn't, doesn't fit that part of the story. I could see if that was right after he was going away or right before he left, they would have that conversation. But to add that into the portion of scripture where Abraham's faith is being confirmed, it just sounds a little out of place to me. Um, so, Well, hadn't he already sent Ishmael away? So how would he have come back into this phase of the story to go with him on this journey to go sacrifice uh, Isaac? It, it doesn't make sense. Where How did that come back, you know? That that was my thoughts. So, yeah, Brian had his hand raised as well, and then I'll come back to you, Mecca, if you want to find more. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had um, yeah, I I had read the book of Jasher a couple of years back, and it, yeah, it, I I do find that interesting that um, uh, Jasher does corroborate that account and the, that's if you, that's in the Targums it's basically verbatim basically is it like the same the same story um, two things I find interesting Isaac I, uh, according to the, 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 the Targum translation Isaac is 30 what was it uh, 36 years old and so he's he's not like people assume like in Christianity people assume that Isaac was like a little boy or something like that Right. And I don't know where it's like, it's like one of those assumptions, like the three wise men, but the Bible don't say it was three wise men. People assume it was three wise men and things like that. But I find that interesting that he was in his 30s. And I think when Yahushua was, was, was crucified, he was also in his 30s as well. I don't know exactly how old he was, but I know he was at least 30 years old. Um, and so I, I find that interesting, uh, interesting parallel between Isaac and Yahushua. About as far as their age when they were uh, being prepared for to be uh, offered up. Um, also, uh, when Isaac, uh, when Isaac told Ishmael that he would, he was, he would offer up all his members, uh, it reminded me of um, in John chapter 10, verse 18, um, that I, the fact that Isaac was willing to do that. Uh, it, 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 it's like to me, it reminds me of what Yahushua said. He said, and uh, just as John 10 18 says, No man taketh it from, from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up, take it again. Um, this commandment have I received, received of my Father. And so you're seeing here that. It's an interesting insight for me because you're seeing here that Isaac was willing to to do this. He it, it, it was like 
it's an interesting parallel between him and Yahusha. Yeah, we know that Yahusha was also willing, willingly laid his life down. And and so yeah, those are two things that I saw there that I thought was interesting from that from the Targum translation. But um yeah, it's so yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, I think um I think you're absolutely right. I mean, matter of fact, that was one of the that was one of the points I was gonna bring out. Um, because this is a prophetical uh, picture of Messiah, um, and that it's definitely going to parallel in every way, from you know, you, uh, Isaac asking where is the lamb, and then John saying, "Behold, the lamb of Yahuwah who takes away the sin of the world." That question is answered. You know, um, it's also answered right there because the ram is in the bush, but prophetically, it's speaking of the seed. So. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the whole idea of Isaac not questioning or not fighting Yahusha, Father, it's your will that I'm following, not mine. You know, all of those things parallel to this very scene at the very same place, you know, so um, good stuff, Brian. Um, go ahead, Emeka, if you wanted to uh, follow up on what you were talking about. Uh yeah, no, I was just I was gonna say, um yeah, you know, there there are certain things that, you know, kinda like uh Brian just mentioned, the age there's things that we don't we assume um he was a young man and we assume certain things, but the scriptures are not really clear, you know, um in telling us, you know, um at least the King James the Masoretic is not really clear in, in giving us certain uh descriptions. So, um you know, I, me personally, I thought this event kind of led up to the trial. You know, whenever you say something or you say you're going to do something for for the father, he's he's going to he's going to test. You know, he's going to test you and try you to see if that's where your heart is. And um, you know, like I'm saying, people would assume like, why would the father have tried? Why would Elohim have tried Abraham like this? And it's not, I don't think it's as much that he's just trying Abraham, but, you know, he's trying it, um, the Isaac as well, saying, okay, these are the words you spoke. Now it gives kind of a more understanding to, it, you know, because a lot of people will, I, I've had this question, why would, you know, why would our creator have somebody offer their, or test somebody with offering their child, you know, offering their, their son? And so it's like now you see like well it wasn't just him saying oh I just want to, I just want to test you like this, but seeing that you know Isaac uh, said you know this is something I would do without hesitation, and so it brings less of a you know to look at oh this is like some bloodthirsty creator who's like yo I just want to test and try man you know what I'm saying and and, and more of a Okay, this is to understand. Okay, so that's why he did it because Yahshik himself said that he would offer himself up, you know. And so, um, you know, I, I think it just gives a little bit more clarity of why this trial was given to Abraham. Yeah, I think um, I, I definitely like the point about the method in which the father used the Tesla. But I also think it, 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 it paints a broader picture of knowing what Abraham was going to do, knowing how he felt, knowing the anguish that he must have gone through, the, the fact that he had, but also believing that, okay, I'm going to do this, but the father's going to raise him back up, as, we, as we'll see later. But the bigger picture is this is exactly what the father did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly the anguish he had to go through to turn away from his son who bore our sin on the trip, mm. you know? Um, did he go through to be separated, you know, because the father and the son had never been separated before. But sin separated them. He had to turn his back on them, you know? And the anguish he must have felt knowing that this was going to come and seeing that Abraham was doing it without hesitation. I mean, that had to blow his mind, you know, and it had to be a beautiful picture for him. So uh, this this passage, 
is the walk to Golgotha, right? As he walks up that hill, it's the same walk Yahushua took. Um, anything else? First four verses. Who wants to read the next four? I'll take them. Good. Bro. Are you reading the uh, Tarje? Uh, no, no, no. I got, I got both. I got both translations here. I got both translations here. <laughs> the charge on. I'm sorry. All right. So verse How five says, and I tar Tarjun T A R J uh, T A R G U M G U N. Okay. Tar no M M as in Mary. Or tar jump, okay. Tar, tar jump, yeah. All right, so uh, verse 5, it says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide you here with the ass, and I and the lad will go, will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and, the, uh, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Yisik spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, Elohim will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. What you want to pull out there? Um, you know, just that, you know, Yisik knew off that, you know, he said, yo, where, where is this lamb that we're supposed to be? Where is this lamb? You know, um, obviously knowing, you know, the customs and the, the tradition, um, you know, of offering, you know, he's like, something's missing here, you know, and I wouldn't doubt if he was, you know, there's no lamb here, you know, what are we, what are we offer? like, what are we offering, you know, just that question, you know, hit his mind, you know, what, what are we offering, there's no lamb, but there's everything that we need for a burnt offering, so, um, you know, that, that to me, All right, we lost him. He is, um, hey, can you guys hear me? We do now. We lost you for a minute. That is just interesting. Uh, bad, like, yo, something's up, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, um, there's so much there. Um, but I, I, I want to hear other people and then I'll, I'll, I'll cap it off. But, uh, where is the lamb? Right. You know, I was looking at it. I said, I wasn't going to talk about it, but I, I was looking at it and it's like, We have to come to that same point because Yahuwah says the blood of bulls and goats was not enough to take away sin of the world. So at some point, even in our sacrifice, where is the lamb? We, we still, we're left there. We're left at that same point. Where is the lamb that's going to wash away our sin? Because we don't have. Without Yahushua, we, is that not our same question? You know, think about it. You know, think about following Torah. Think about uh, observing the feasts. Think about, you know, observing the Shabbat, coming together, praying, reading his word. Where's the lamb? Because <laughs> as I'm reading and I'm studying and I'm doing the feast, I still need a lamb. 
right? So, so we have to look at that completely. Like, I really want us, and I think we're doing it, but I really want you know all of those that can hear us talk to understand that this word is meant for us. It's not just a story. It's meant for us. It's meant for us to look at and find out where do we fit? What do you want from us? What are you saying to me, oh Yahuwah? <laughs> that's, what it's, that's what it's asking. So important for us to look at those things. Um, go ahead, um, uh, Rick. <laughs> First thing that really stuck out to me in this is on the third day. You know, there's there's a reference, again, to the Mashiach, you know, on the third day. You know, that uh, that he, he lifted up his eyes and he saw, well, he, he lifted up his left top of his eyes and he saw the left top of the place far off. So, you know, this whole, this whole thing is just riddled with, uh, left top covenant symbols all over the place. We find it again in this, uh, chapter six where Abraham took a left top of the wood. Even the wood is a covenant. You know, he took a left top of the fire, a left top of the knife. You know, everything that was used in this was uh, symbolic of a, of a covenant that was being established. Every every little detail was all encompassing. You know, this this event that was about to take place. The one thing that kind of also stuck out to me from what Mecca was reading on the other version where Isaac said that he was willing to offer up all of his uh, body parts, whatever he said, uh, I forget the exact terms that were used. That was what Isaac said, correct? In that term, Mecca, in, the, in that version that you read from, wasn't that Isaac that men mentioned that he was willing to offer up his members? That's what it was. I think that was Ishmael. Oh, Ishmael was the one that said that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I misunderstood then what, what was there because I was going to say if he said, if he did make that statement, if it was Isaac, which I'm now you're saying is Ishmael, so maybe that just changes everything my thought was. But if he, if he did offer and say that, make that statement, then it wouldn't make sense what he would say, well, where's the offering? You know, where's the lamb or, you know, the ram, you know, if that was the case. But I, I see that you're still muted. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe he was saying that was Ishmael. But you're right. If he's saying that that version said it was Isaac, then where's the lamb wouldn't make sense. Right. It would. I mean, that's why we got to We got to test that stuff. Right. I like to confirm that if it was Ishmael or Isaac, because it wouldn't make sense that Ishmael would say that, but maybe I misunderstood what was what he read. But um, anyways, those are the things that really stood out to me. I just see covenant everywhere. Mashiach everywhere, you know, prophecy. I mean, it's all just riddled throughout this, this one little story, this little, you know, nugget here. So, Good stuff, brother. Yeah, man. I, you know, this. I keep trying to. T we keep saying it to the World Wide Web. The gospel does not start in Matthew. It starts in Genesis. Um. And this is why I was so excited about you know these particular verses, chapters as well, twenty two, particularly twenty two and twenty four, but they're prophetic, you know, and how this is missed. You know, man, the three days. Are you kidding me? You know? The hill, you know, the the peak of the mountain, Mount Moriah, now later Golgotha, you know. Carrying the wood. He carried the wood. Yahusha carried the, the tree on his back. Come on, man. Like, you can't see this stuff. And it's so beautiful that we can't. Right? It's so beautiful that we can, that I can read this and I see the Messiah. You know? And this has got to be coming. I'm reading this and it's, it's got, you know, Moshe wrote this obviously as told to by the Ruach, but you can see that this is from the Father's perspective. 
because everything that's said here, you know, I mean, think of Psalm 69, 23, coming from Yahushua's perspective. Now look at this. This is coming from the father's perspective. This is what a father would say about a situation that happened with him and his son. This is how he would feel, you know? Watching his son be inquisitive about these things and like, dad, where's the lamb? I mean, I see the wood, I see everything else. Where's the lamb? You know, and the compassion of the father to give us this. Man. Maybe another side of that is also the comparison with Abraham and, and Yahuwah being fathers and uh, right. him as, uh, offering up his son, you know, or being asked to offer him up. You know, Yahuwah had to go through that same thing to offer of his son that, that he's asking of Abraham. So it's really, a, there's so much parallel here. It's, a, it's really incredible when you really start dissecting and, and really seeing what's being said here between the lines. It's all prophetic, brother, just like you said. Yeah, man. Um, go ahead, Brian. I was just looking at verse eight there when he asked after his son asked him where's where's the lamb he says, Alran said my son Yah will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering, so they went forth both together. And I was just thinking about yeah how Yah how prophetic that is because Yah did he did offer he did provide the lamb, uh, Yahusha, and I was just thinking about like, Isaiah fifty three five. Um, um, and yeah, he was, uh, um, what was the, uh, yeah, but he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. And, um, and it goes on, but, um, yeah, like Abraham says, like, I just, Feel like yeah, it was so prophetic. He said the father will provide himself a lamb, and it wasn't just like yeah. In, in the natural, he did provide provide a, a a lamb in the thicket, but but it was just it's all pointing to his son Yahusha, and and yeah, he did indeed fulfill the, the prophecy. It's like yeah, he's like Abraham here is prophesying Yahusha, uh, the father providing that lamb. Uh, for our, that, that land, that blood that covers the multitude of sin and, and the atonement, the everything that entails Yahushua being our high priest and and everything. So yeah, I was just that's all I saw there. So. You know, in um, John chapter one twenty nine verse twenty nine, it says the next day John saw Yahushua coming toward him and said, "Behold." the Lamb of Yahuwah, who takes away the sin of the world. And it's like Yisrael was asking, where is the Lamb? And, and John says, here he is. Here he comes. You know, and how that answers the question that Isaac had. You know, ultimately, um, we know that there's a ram in the bush. And just like, you know, Hagar didn't see the well because of her torment, because of her anguish. Could it be that Abraham didn't see the ram? That the angel of Yah had to show him there's a ram in the bush, you know? Um, Yahuwah himself will provide a lamb. Um, Brian, you want to take the next eight, the uh, next four? Uh, yeah. Starting in verse nine. Okay. Um, go to t go through twelve. So read up to thirteen. Yeah. And they came to the place which Yah had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son and the angel of Yah called unto him 
out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, lay not thine hand upon thine lad, neither do thy anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest Yah, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Um, that last, that last first twelve is interesting to me because um, uh, when you look at it, like, like Yahusha made a comment to his, I think to his disciples, he said, "If you love, if you love anyone more than me, you're not worthy. You're not worthy of the kingdom. If you love your son, your mother, your." wife love any, anything more than me you're not worthy of the kingdom i'm, I'm not sure exactly what, where that is right now in my head but i was just thinking about that like like totally surrendering uh, and dying to yourself and um uh, and what the disciples did like they left everything and and followed yahusha and they had their their career like the fish there some were fishermen some of them were tax was a tax collector uh, they had families and all that and they forsook all and followed Yahusha and just completely dying to your own will and surrendering yourself and becoming that that living sacrifice unto Yah and uh, and and that's what I was just thinking about in this last verse here that Abraham was willing to to do that like he loved Yah so much that that yeah he loved his son but he loved Yah more and and he showed himself worthy of the of the kingdom worthy to be used of of, of Yah and um and yeah that's this first of all I saw that last that first twelve there that's all yeah. Yeah, that's that's what Rick was pointing out too, how because Rick started talking about the parallel between the father and Abraham, and how Yahuwah would immediately recognize this being a genuine a genuine exhibition of his faith, because this is exactly what he had to like he's he's watching him, <laughs> he's watching him respond without hesitation, you know. And he was going to do it because he believed, because here's one of the things that, that, that we skipped over that I meant to pull out, but it does, it didn't make sense until we read this part. Um, in verse five, it says, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So in, in Abraham's mind and heart, he was going to do exactly what Yahuwah told him to do, but somehow Yahuwah was going to resurrect him and raise him from the dead and he was coming back. So his faith, he, he had already exhibited it. It was the continual mindset that took him up the hill, laid the wood, bound his son, as it says in verse 9, he bounds him, puts him down, and, and was going to uh, take his life at the place. <laughs> it says, it says, and they came to the place of which Yah had told him. That's important because that's definite article, the place which Yahuwah provides, which later, prophetically, he does provide in the exact same place. So, um, Verse 12, you know, answers that that statement that he made to his young men, to his uh, servants. Me and the lad will return. And it, it also tells me something about worship, too, because, you know, he says we'll go yonder and worship. And we think of songs and singing and stuff like that, but he was about to go slaughter his son. So this worship has, has everything to do with a propitiation or a substitu substitutionary 
atonement. This has to do with giving the Father that which is acceptable in purity. You know, yes, we can sing songs. Yes, we can pray. Yes, we can shout. But in purity and in sincerity, because if you bring anything less, you know, it's not accepted, right? So we need to look at what worship is here. You know, I mean, Rick broke that down, you know, more than once, but I, I believe that he's telling us something right there in that, in that verse we forgot to look, I forgot to look at, but in verse 12, he, he definitely answers that with telling Abraham what he just showed him. So, but, well, in worshiping, you're talking about bowing down, kneeling before, heeding too. So, in a sense, that's exactly what Abraham was doing. He was he was he was bowing down before Yahuwah, believing, like you said, that he gave him a promise that this this was going to be the the he would make him a a, a a a seed of many nations. You know, he so he knew that there ain't no way Yahuwah could take his son and not give him back to him. If he was actually going to make a covenant that he was going to be a father of many nations, so and and it was going to be through this seed, so that that was interesting that you pointed that out. It was a, I mean, my mind is just riddled here. Something that's really, really, really drawn my my attention here is I see that in the beginning, Elohim is speaking to Abraham, and he's saying, "Behold, I here I am." Then in this verse here, where's he at again? He talks about, uh, he, the, it says that the angel of Yahuwah spoke. And he says, here I am. I believe that that angel of Yahuwah is Yahusha himself that's in the middle of all of this. He's the one that's corresponding and speaking to Abraham. And, you know, it, 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 you think that this is going to be a prophetic picture to him of knowing what may be coming in his future? that he sees the same thing happening because we see, again, I left Tobbs in a very appropriate places through this. When we're looking at verse nine, we see the first one where he, Elohim, which we know can be Yahuwah, Yahusha, the combination of the two told him. So I believe that's Yahusha telling him to, to go build a left Tob an altar uh, and bound a left Tob Jacob, his son. And, and laid him a left top on the altar. So these are all, again, covenant. They're all part of this covenant <coughs> that he's establishing here to protect this young man. And then Abraham stretched out his left top of his hand, and he took a left top of the knife to slay a left top of his son. I mean, we see this 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 role playing out until you, until we see Yahuwah called out of the of the Shamaim and said Abraham. So we have the. Elohim, we have the angel of uh, of, uh, of Yahuwah, and Yahuwah himself all mentioned in here speaking to Abraham. I believe, again, this is all Yahusha that's doing the speaking on behalf of Yahuwah, but it's just, it's just amazing how you see all of this laid out before us and how the symbolisms of all of this, you know, like you said, the wood, the, you know, the, the altars, the, the son, the only begotten sons, we see that this, there's, this story here contains so much more than I've ever seen by just reading over it and not really looking at what it's really saying, but assuming, you know, but then, you know, there's just so much here where he's speaking to this guy and he's always saying, here I am. Why, why is it, why is that always a statement? I wonder, you know, Whenever he's calling out to Abraham, we've been seeing the same phrase every single time that Yahuwah calls out to him, here I am. Like he don't know you're here? Here you are. He's saying, hey, I'm, I hear you? Is that what he's kind of saying? Is I'm, I'm here, I'm listening. You know, I, I just find that those phrase, that phrase really, it seems like there's something more there than just a simple, I'm here. Hello, you know, you know. I don't know what it is there, but it just, it's the same phrase that he uses continuously when he's being spoken to by Yahuwah, Yahusha, the Elohim of Yahuwah, you know, on and on and on. So that's what I see. 
Yeah, I agree with you, man. That, that That's definitely Yahusha. I wanted to read a, uh, a passage in out of James that connects to verse 12 we just read. And it says, uh, um, James chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Do you see that faith was working together with his works? By works of, of by works, faith was, I'm sorry, let's back up. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by the works of faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed Yahweh, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of Yah. You see then that, that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. So, <clears throat> and we talked about the Hebrew meanings of words and the fact that they those words have legs those words have action you can't say you love somebody without showing them that you do you know you can't have i can't tell my wife i love her but never do anything to show her that never say anything to her that expresses that never do anything that makes it clear to her there's no question you know, because if, if I do, I got a problem, you know, and same thing with your children. Same thing with say you love Yahuwah, but you're a derelict at work. You steal money. You steal time. You know what I mean? All those things match. They matter. And here, James specifically shows us what Abraham did, that he believed him. And the fact that he believed him, he raised the knife. To sacrifice his son, his son. but um, and Emeka wants to say something. I'm gonna let him say something, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of talk about something else pertaining to sacrifice. Go ahead, Emeka. While you're before you speak, Emeka, there was a question when you went away about what you read in the other version. Was who was it Ishmael or was it Isaac that talked about offering up their members? It was Isaac. Well, then there you go. Then that there's another conflict that we have. That why would he offer up and say he would offer up his members, and yet he's asking the question, "Where's the lamb?" You know, it do, it doesn't well make sense to me. I don't th I don't think he knew he was going to be like. I don't think he knew that Yahu was testing his father to say like you know, to see if he was the lamb. I'm, I'm not, I don't think he knew that he was going to be the offering. But, you know, I think it was just a question of, you know, like just it was a conversation they had and him saying this is how much faith I had that and, and love I have for the father that if he asked, you know, if I was asked to be an offering, I would offer myself up. So now when Abraham He's not initially told that he's going to be the offering until they go up and get to the mountain. Um, and in the Tarjum, he asked Abraham, you know, where is the lamb? When he asked him where is the lamb, and he says, Yahu will provide a lamb. And if not, he tells them, you will be the offering. And then they continue up the, to the mountain. So in the Tarjum, it does clarify um, a little bit more in detail. Um, or has a little bit more description on the event saying that he didn't know when they were on their way up to the mountain that he would be the lamb if Yahu didn't offer um, a lamb that he would be it. So there's a there's a little bit more yeah, in that's, here. That's, that's just, hard. Yeah, that, that's kind of difficult for me there because it sounds like it sounds like there's information known and then it's put back in a place that goes before what actually happens rather than it being in a place where a person prophetically says something. You know what I mean? But, you know, again, uh, we got to test everything. But go ahead. You were going to add something to what we just read? Yeah. Um, 
Game First Samuel. Uh, I'm gonna read a couple, a few, just two scriptures. Uh, the first one, First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Um, and it says, and Samuel said, "Have have Yahuwah has as the uh, as Yahuwah as great delight in offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yahuwah." Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And then in Romans chapter six, uh, says, uh, you know, let therefore let not sin for reign in your body, that you should obey and bless thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto Yahuwah a lot from and the members as instruments of righteousness unto Yahuwah. Sin does not have dominion over you, for you are not under the Torah but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the Torah but under grace? Never. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience, obedience unto unrighteousness. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. To of obedience unto righteousness. But Yah be thanked that you were the servants of sin form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Of righteousness. Um, I speak after the manner of men because the infirmities of your flesh for as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and toilless deeds unto toilless deeds, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and holiness. And so the reason I brought this out was because, you know, we see here, you know, even Abraham, you know, like you said, his his works were obedience and faith. You know, the works that he did was being obedient to the word of Yahuwah when he when he chose to make that, you know, to to try, you know, to go forward with making a sacrifice of Isaac, you know, and I think that when you spoke of, you know, there's a greater purpose here, you know, um just even, you know, Yisik, you know, according to the Tarjim, seeing that Yisik was gonna offer his members up, you know, his body up. You know, and then seeing that Abraham being obedient to the voice of Yahuwah, you know, it's like even today, this is this is something that is difficult, will be difficult for any person, you know, to do, especially in today's age, to offer up your only son, you know. And so when I think of looking at the Torah, I think of how simple is it just to obey the Torah, you know, in faith, you know, in faith of Yahuwah, but he's not asking us to sacrifice our, our 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 children or you know anything outrageous he's just asking us to obey his simple commands you know and i think you know comparing to compared to offering up your only son obeying torah should be quite simple and understandable and it shouldn't be something that we have to argue or debate over you know it should be you know, like like Samuel said, obedience is, is better than sacrifice. So to be obedient to his words shouldn't even be an issue or a problem as, as it seems to be the center of debate, you know, in the faith. So that's what I wanted to bring out. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> good point, man. I think a lot of people uh, lose the context of what Shaul was pointing out um, because he's referring to sin, you know, having dominion. And the whole point of him saying, obedience is better than sacrifice is that obeying <laughs> leads to not having to sacrifice. You know, we, we Absolutely. obey, but there is no sacrifice needed other than Yahusha. So if we're following Torah, if we're obeying, these are the things that we do in, in Yahusha and that they are not done away with. So um, that, that context needs to be seen uh, completely too. Um, but yeah, good stuff, man. And um, I, and it and it part it, it pushes me right into what I wanted to talk about because you know we talked about earlier about discerning. 
um, in Rick's message this morning. And one of the things <clears throat> we talked about, one of the passages he pulled out was the Colossians passage where it tells us to discern between, you know, uh, false teachers, you know, those that would lead us astray. And to me, it's amazing how many people are led astray, but it makes sense. The warning, you know, was for a reason. The warning is because it was definitely going to happen. It was going to happen that people would try to come. And where is that false falsity coming from? It's coming from Asata, right? And how he imitates and how something as beautiful as um, a, a, a father's faith being seen clear by his actions to obey Yahuwah in doing this and what he told him to do, this is taken by Satan and, and Hasatan and even used by the Babylonian Empire and, and even today, child worship, right? Where does it, they turn that into an evil thing, you know? This doesn't, this isn't uh, 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 something that's supposed to be taken and distorted and used in a way for good. This was to show that this was necessary and this was what was going to be done. It's a prophetical picture. It was a prophetical picture saying, you don't have to do this because I'm going to do it myself. And Hasatan has taken it and said, no, this is part of our worship. So he tries to imitate the father. He tries to be like the father, but everything he does is, is a distortion and an abomination. So I just wanted to point that out because, you know, we have to recognize these things when we see, you know, all of these things happening in the world. And we look at um, the sacrifices and the, the child pornography and the child, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, trafficking and, and all of these things. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of sacrifice. And even to the point of, of killing. You know, where, where, where kid, children are killed, you know, so um, as a ceremonial thing. So, um, you know, it just paints a larger picture of how the em enemy operates in, in trying to imitate what the father has done. Um, it's supposed to be a beautiful picture of taking away the sin of the world. So, um Good stuff, brothers. All of you are, are, are really um, illuminating this chapter. Uh, we're, we're, we stopped in verse 12. Uh, I'll read, I'll read, I'll read up to chapter, to verse 20, starting in verse 13. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram, and he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. I see that? Instead of. Substitute. Y'all see that? And Abraham called the name of the place Yahuwah will provide. And it is said to this day, in the mount of Yahuwah, it shall be provided. Then the angel of Yahuwah called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says Yahuwah, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. So quite a bit here. Um, we talked about that same place Yahuwah will provide, Mount Moriah being the same, Golgotha, 
at the peak of the mountain where Yahushua was crucified, right? The angel of the Yo and like Rick said, the angel of the Lord, he said, by myself. So this has to be Yahushua speaking to him. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the, the, this is what what uh, what I what I saw here in verse 16. It says, I'm sorry, 17. It says, "Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and the sand which is on the seashore." And I looked into, and it's a Hebrew idiom uh, to double up what you're saying. It's it's showing how much of a blessing it's gonna be. I'm gonna bless you upon blessings. I'm gonna multiply you upon multiplication. Your descendants will be as the stars of the heavens, which can be un which can't be counted, and the sand of the seashore, which is a plethora of sand at the seashore. So he's he's showing him how great you know these things are gonna be. Um, because you have obeyed. And 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 the last thing I saw was that Abraham returned to his young men uh, with with Isaac, just like he said he would. <laughs> he told them, me, I, me and Isaac will be back after we go worship. We're, we're coming back together. So uh, those are the things I saw. What do you guys see there? See a lot of the same things you see. A lot of the left tiles, once again, and all the way throughout here, are very important placements of them. You know, his his a left eye of his son, his a left eye of his only son. You know, he he lifted up his uh, his a left eye of eyes. You know, uh, the ram was, uh, has has a left eye before it. Uh, that's uh, you know definitely goes back to the covenant that Yahusha has established as being the lamb that was provided. Um, and Abraham called the name of the place Yahuwah Yireh, Yahuwah will provide. So it's Abraham that made that declaration, as it is said to this day, in the mount of Yahuwah, it shall be seen. Is it, and he's going to be seen again later on in history that it's going to be the same lamb that's going to be provided on that, you know, in that same way. And, uh, and then again, we see the uh, the angel of Yahuwah called out to Abraham a second time. Like you said, that's that double portion, that overflowing baraka that he's that he's about to instill upon him and his seed, because he, he's even swearing it by himself because of what he has done. The left out of this thing, so it was a covenant thing that he done before Yahuwah that he would. Uh, he would hold nothing back from this baraka that's going to be placed upon him and his seed because he lifted up his covenant son, his, his only covenant son, to be able to be sacrificed because Yahuwah asked him to do it. And because he was willing to, to, to give back what Yahuwah had already given him, that established him in a way of being the father of, uh, of faith, believing, trusting in Yahuwah that he even took it to the point where he he was willing to give back that something so precious that was promised to him, trusting Yahuwah, that Yahuwah would provide that son right back to him. He wouldn't take his life, or if he did, he would he would raise him again. You know, that's a serious faith uh, and belief and believing a hundred years for something. And then finally getting it and then and then, and then being said, Well, you need to offer him up. And because he was willing to do so, as the scriptures you read earlier in the Brit, it takes us back to, it was his action. It was his work uh, of willing to do something for Yahuwah that Yahuwah said that, that made him who he is, placed this baraka upon him and his seed, this double baraka, that in blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your seed, your left of your seed. As many as there is stars and in, in, in even sand on the seashores, that his seed, the left tav, shall possess the gates of his enemy. So again, now he's telling us that his seed 
which is us, are going to have the, the ability to, to overcome our enemy. There are so many promises in this. It's just amazing when you take time to really read it like we are, what this says, how it con confirms our faith, our belief in what the Mashiach has done and how it really is a foreshadowing of the Mashiach and how is he, he was even involved in this. And maybe that's why he said, you know, you know, can you take this cup from me? But nevertheless, let your will be done. Because he already knew, you know, if the father was going to, if he if father was willing to offer him up, that he was going to raise him up anyways. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm amazed by this, this study. This is beautiful. I agree, brother. I, I appreciate that. I, you know, <clears throat> the things that you just uh, brought out with the Olive Tives and, you know, the relation to um, <clears throat> even us as being those, those, those morsels, those granules of sand, we too have the power to overcome our enemies. Man, that's, I never saw that. <clears throat> and I didn't say that part, so that's, that's good, man. <clears throat> that's good. That's real good. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you're right. It's just, it's just uh, you know, and I started to take seven verses at a time, but see how much you get when you break it down to four? Because it's too much that you can pass over it, you know? Go ahead, Emeka. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. No worries. Um, you know, what I, what I also seen was that, you know, when you look at it, it's like... <clears throat> Number one, you know, just like Mashiach, you know, Yahuwah, you know, as Yahusha, Yahuwah provided that ram. He provided that sacrifice for the sin, you know. And not only did he just provide it, um, he provided it out of nowhere. So you think of the virgin birth and you think of, of, of where did this baby come from? How was this ba baby, um, you know, where did the seed come from? Well, the seed came from. Elohim, you know, it came with most people just say it came out of nowhere, you know, but it came out of nowhere from Elohim. And so, you know, when you when you look at it, the ram now by his by his horns, you know, by his head was caught in the thicket. It was caught in the in the the shrubs or in the trees, you know, it was caught in the world. And so Yahusha was born in the in the thicket, he was caught and snared by the world to be sacrificed, you know? And I'm just like, dang, like, man, that's, man, that's just seeing that. And, and you know, how it talks about, um, Jadiel brought out one day how he was studying with his son and he seen that, you know, when Yahushua was healing one of the blind men, at first he, he rubbed his eyes and then, he said, what do you see? And he said, I see men walking as trees. And then he, he rubbed his eyes again. And then he seen, uh, oh, he said, I see, I can see now, you know, he, he was able to see clearly, but just the fact that the first time he was saying, I see men walking as trees, that kind of, to me connects as like these, this thicket, you know, or this, this ram being caught up and, and these people being the bushes or the snare, you know, that caught Yahushua you know, um, you know, and, 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 sent, and, and crucified him or sent him to his crucifixion, you know, him being caught by the, the wickedness of the world, you know? And so, man, it, it, that was, that, I just seen that for the, for the first time. And so I'm just like, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. You know, yeah. something you just said there, brother, that really stuck out to me. Yahusha had that crown of thorns on his head, just like this ram, was yeah. caught up in the thickets in his head. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually going to point that out. And along with, I like the passage that you just uh, uh, read when you mentioned Jadiel teaching his son and, and the uh, men walking his trees because <clears throat> the idea that a blind man they had never seen before now sees men walking as trees. 
points me back to Psalms chapter one when he said, you know, the one that follows Yahuwah, the one that follows Torah, the one that trusts in him will be like a tree planted by the rivers, being fully nourished and able to bear fruit in its season. That's what we're supposed to be. Trees <laughs> with fruit that you can see and how that was the first thing that this man, this blind man saw, you know, so that's, that's, a, that's a message within itself. Um, but that's one of my favorite passages. If you, don't, you guys don't know by now, Psalms chapter one. I love that passage because there's so much there. There's so much there. Um, yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's do the last four verses. I could take that if no one else wants to read. read. All right. <clears throat> Chapter uh, 20, Genesis 22, verses 20 through 24. Now it came to pass after these things, marking a shift again, that it was told Abraham saying, indeed, Milka also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Shest, Hazo, Pildash, Jilaf, or Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ramah, also bore Taba, Gaham, Fahash, and Mekah. So <clears throat> you look at these names, but then it becomes clear what the focus name here is. Um, this is obviously uh, the, you know, the genealogy of, of, of uh, Nahor, but the name that stands out is Rebecca, who would be who? Who's Rebecca going to be? Anyone? Isaac's wife. Right. So, you know, sometimes... <laughs> We read through these, and as we've known, done before, we've read through names and found out the meanings. Here, it's a clear picture or a fore picture of who is going to be with Isaac because the next chapter we look at um, Sarah's death and burial, and then chapter 24, we're going to look at a bride for Isaac. And that's also going to be prophetical as we read ahead to get prepared for that. So, um, great way to end this study. Um, you know, that those four verses particularly bring out where Rebecca is coming from. If anybody else sees anything more, uh, you know, you can speak on it. Otherwise, we're going to uh, end the study. Well, she's not his sister. <laughs> she's close, though. Tor brought the forbidden of these things later, but customary to keep kinfolk close, you know what I mean? Interesting, you know. But all right, brothers, this concludes our Genesis chapter 22. And again, we really enjoyed this passage. We really enjoyed the connection to Messiah. We enjoyed looking at the passages in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, and finding out <clears throat> that the gospel starts in Genesis, not in Matthew. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.